You're listening to Garden Futurist. I'm Sarah Beck, here with Adrian St. Clair. Hi, Adrian. Hi, Sarah. I'm really glad that this conversation, which I think is a need-to-know conversation, was with Aaron Anderson, who is about the most fun person to talk to. He can balance the tragic news with the interest and beauty and amazement all at the same time. Totally. It's really cool to have an opportunity to talk to Aaron because the work he's doing is so specifically urban. Using a perspective on the garden experience, you know, it's so specialized. It's really great for us to get to hear this angle. You know, I think very few of us as horticulture people have as broad a knowledge of the invertebrates that are garden related. This is one of the things I enjoy most about this podcast is that there's so many aspects of horticulture that I am interested in, but I can't be the official person to talk to. I can't be the professional on this one. And so here's another aspect of something that's so fascinating, but takes so much time to fully understand. What was your prior knowledge on some of this pesticide toxicity question? I'm curious what your baseline on this was. It's not something I research on my own. So I haven't done a lot of the reading that makes me confident in talking about it. And so what I hear are just these snippets that make me concerned about learning more. I'll hear snippets about glyphosate killing off soil bacteria and thinking about soil health. Aaron talks about the microbes in the gut flora of insects and affecting gut flora and microbes. And so I think that this is one of those questions that cascades from the level of soil microbes to insect gut microbes to human gut microbes and just there's so many layers to think about and I think that we're going to see that developing as we learn more and more about these chemicals and how they persist in our system. Our guest today is Aaron Anderson, Pesticide Program Specialist, Towns and Cities Lead, Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. I did want to ask you Invertebrates, that is a really big term. And I'm assuming you're not actually conserving every invertebrate. Can you just give a little bit of the area of concentration of the organization of Xerces Society and just to cue us up to this? So Xerces has been around since 1971, working to protect wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates in their habitats. And our name is a reference to the Xerces blue butterfly, which is believed to be the first American butterfly to go extinct due to human development and actually lived kind of close to where you are in the coastal sand dunes around San Francisco. And our area of interest, you know, are basically all invertebrates. So, you know, these are animals without backbones. But a lot of our work is insect conservation, in particular pollinators like bees, native bees in particular, butterflies. But we also have people working on things like freshwater mussel conservation. We have a firefly program working to protect fireflies. And we work in agriculture areas, wildland areas, urban areas, really kind of across the board. So I think a lot of our species-specific work, like you said, invertebrates are a really broad group. So we can't be monitoring and intentionally trying to conserve every single one. But a lot of the work we do, the broader like habitat protection, pesticide reduction does benefit this really broad group of animals that are so important to us and to ecosystems. I was thinking, this is very on the spot. Can you do a five minutes and you'll love invertebrates? I don't know if I can do five minutes, but at least like a minute long pitch about invertebrates. It doesn't have to be the typical charismatic species. Yeah. So what I think is so cool about invertebrates is that we don't notice them. So many of them, especially different types of insects, are so small or they might just live places that we don't go typically. Like when you're talking about aquatic species or nocturnal species that we just don't see, they do so many important things for us. You know, you think about pollination, you think about pest control, nutrient cycling, but beyond the ecosystem services and the benefits they provide to ecosystems as well, they're just fascinating creatures. You know, when you look at them closely, you have bees that are all sorts of different metallic colors. You have just a beautiful diversity of butterflies. You start looking at things like flies or parasitoid wasps. They have all this cool morphology, like amazing antennae that are branching different directions. They're just these really, really cool 
group of animals. And a lot of us just aren't aware of them when we're out in a garden or going for a walk because so many of them are so small. Unless you're really intentionally looking for them and you have an idea of what to look for, it's really easy to miss them. One of the really cool things that I get to do in my work is when I'm doing outreach, opening people's eyes to the wonder of these creatures. And I think that's something that the more people appreciate how cool they are, how beautiful they are, how important they are, hopefully the more willing they will be and more interested they'll be in conserving them and protecting them. I was thinking about the parasitic wasps. I mean, some of those are absolutely fascinating and a lot of them are pretty teeny tiny, right? Some of them are just, you almost need a microscope to really see them. Yeah. I think the cool thing about parasitoid wasps, they're an incredibly diverse group of insects. I think Every insect on Earth, they, scientists think there's at least one parasitoid wasp species that will parasitize it. What? It's an incredible diversity and hundreds of thousands of species, so many that scientists haven't even described yet. But yeah, they can't sting you. So instead of a stinger, they have an ovipositor, which is an egg-laying structure at the base of the abdomen. So don't be freaked out when you see that. Don't be freaked out. Exactly. Yeah. So they're going around your garden and in agricultural areas and natural areas, and they're laying their eggs in or on different insects. And they hatch, emerge, and consume the insects. And they play incredibly important roles in pest control, both yeah, at home and in agricultural systems. Let me just ask you a little bit more about your specific work, because your role at Xerces is the Pesticide Program Specialist Towns and Cities Lead. And I think the Towns and Cities piece is especially relevant and interesting We've talked a lot about urban ecology recently at Pacific Horticulture, and I'm curious if you could explain what that important city-town component is. So I work primarily, as you were saying, in residential and urban areas, encouraging both private individuals as well as municipalities to reduce or eliminate pesticide use in order to you know, protect invertebrates and encourage alternative pest control measures and pollinator-friendly gardening practices You know, when it comes to home gardeners. you know, I guess to kind of taking a step back, I'm guessing most of our listeners are likely aware of this, but there's many recent studies that are documenting declines in insect populations and communities worldwide. And in particular, many pollinators, you know, including bees and butterflies, are imperiled. And that data is patchy since you know, many insects, in fact, most insects aren't carefully monitored. But the data we do have almost all points to decreases in populations. And we know enough to know that it's essential to kind of take action to conserve pollinators and these other insects we care about. And one of the leading causes of insect declines that scientists agree on is pesticide use or you know, exposure to pesticides. So despite that doom and gloom about insect declines I just mentioned, our residential landscapes, so where we live, where we work, where we play, these landscapes can support beneficial insects, you know, like pollinators. And in fact, urban areas can actually support a surprisingly abundant and relatively intact bee communities, depending on the location, largely because we provide flowering resources, you know, from spring into fall when bees are out flying in the form of flowering plants in our yards and our parks. And, and you know, there's some studies that suggest that some urban areas can also have a lower pesticide exposure than surrounding areas if they're, you know, heavily agricultural, for example, so they can potentially serve as refuges as well. So because of this, you know, residential areas really do have a high conservation potential for invertebrates, which is something I find really exciting working in these spaces. And I think that potential is even greater if we were designing and managing these spaces, thinking about the needs of these insects. So when we're gardening for habitat, you know, invertebrates need food, they need shelter. And then there's a final piece, which is protection from pesticides. Right. So just to get into the scope and the seriousness of the pesticide issue, can you give us a sense of just how much of an impact this has? You mentioned the insect apocalypse conversation, and I think you're right that I think a lot of gardeners are aware of this. But when we think about the climate change impacts and other issues, it sounds like you're saying that the pesticide piece of this is a really big piece of our concerns about invertebrates. Some of those major causes, you know, habitat loss and fragmentation is the leading one. But then also, yeah, pesticide exposure, like you were saying, climate change, different pests and pathogens. These are all contributors. And it's hard to disentangle all of these because they're all kind of interacting at once. 
insecticides are highly toxic to pollinators, not just pests. Some insecticides are more targeted than others in the groups of insects that they impact, but many tend to be very broad. They'll kill the target pests, but also everything else. So when they're used, you know, in a residential area, in a garden, in a park, you know, it's not just going to impact the pest. These beneficial insects, pollinators that are exposed to these chemicals will also be impacted. Modern insecticides are very potent and newer ones. You know, you may have heard of neonicotinoids or neonics that have been made to replace older chemicals aren't more friendly to bees and are often more concerning. I guess I want to emphasize that we're concerned about more than just insecticides. You know, in particular, there are both fungicides and herbicides that have been shown to have some negative impacts on pollinators and other insects. Fungicides are often classified as practically non-toxic, but some have been linked with some kind of subtle yet still harmful effects. One concern is that there's some types of fungicides that will actually interact synergistically with certain insecticides, meaning they increase the toxicity when they're present together. There's worries about some of these chemicals across the board, not just insecticides. I should mention herbicides too. You know, the, the main impact of herbicides is that they remove flowering plants from the landscape. These flowering plants are what provide the pollen and nectar that bees and other insects rely on for food. But there's also some studies that suggest that there can be some direct impacts as well. One in particular suggests that glyphosate might impact honeybees' abilities to navigate and potentially interfere with their gut microbiome, which might make them more susceptible to disease. These are called sublethal effects. So they're things that might not directly kill a bee, but if their navigation's impaired and they're not able to find food as efficiently and make it back to their nest as quickly, you know, these little things can over time add up at the population level. That is so sad to think about. It's really tragic. We think so much about how we want to build resilience generally within a garden and create all of the components to help support the complete ecosystem. I know you probably also have some information on drift or if you're not the one applying some of these chemicals, but someone else nearby is, I'm sure there are concerns there as well. I really would love for you to talk a little bit just about how you and other researchers have done some investigation of the impacts of pesticides. I'm just very curious how scientists are even coming to understand some of these things. What you're talking about is so complex. I can speak in more detail to some of the limited research that we've actually been doing at the Xerxes Society. Even though we're not, you know, primarily a research organization, we still dabble in some research, which is really great. So I think on one hand, you have, okay, what's the toxicity of this particular chemical? I think the other part of what you're asking is also out in the environment, what are these insects being exposed to? Where's the contamination coming from? What is the actual risk? Over the last couple of years, we've been doing some pesticide residue sampling because often we don't really know what's out there, how much contamination is there and what chemicals are there and where are they. Before I started, there was a couple sampling projects that, that Xerces did with partners. One was looking at pesticide residues on milkweed at sites up and down the Central Valley of California in a variety of different landscapes. Another one was looking at pesticide residues on milkweeds from nurseries, actually, at 15 different states across the country to get a sense of when somebody is buying a pollinator planting for monarch habitat, what's the risk of pesticide exposure? And so then I've been involved in two research projects that we've been doing. So in 2022, we sampled pesticide residues on butterfly host plants in Sacramento and in Albuquerque to get a sense of in these urban areas on these butterfly host plants that butterflies are relying on, what's that background level of pesticide contamination that's out there? And I should note, we just got the results back from the lab for that. So stay tuned. Hope Hopefully, coming up in 2024, we'll have some publications from that. And in this past summer, I led a sampling project looking at residues from residential mosquito sprays in Georgia, Massachusetts, and in Iowa to try to get a sense of the amount of drift that those sprays are producing and the risk those sprays pose to habitat both in sprayed yards and in neighboring yards. You know, I'm trying to create this pollinator habitat in my yard, but my neighbor's spraying. What's the risk? So we're trying to get at that a little bit. You're listening to Garden Futurist. We'll be back in a moment. Garden Futurists come in all sizes. And I'm sure we have yours because the Pacific Horticulture Marketplace is now open. Share your Garden Futurist identity around town and in the garden with comfy, sustainable t-shirts and sweatshirts, Hit the trail in an activewear shirt or be the most amazing auntie or uncle when you show up with a statement onesie. 
All make great gifts and you'll be supporting the good work of Pacific Horticulture with every purchase. Shop now, pacifichorticulture.org slash shop. Introduced in the spring of 2012, the Sunset Plant Collection was the first plant collection designed specifically for the Western gardener. Through breeder partnerships across the nation and around the globe and collaborations with local growers, the Sunset Plant Collection is customized to best meet the climatic differences and challenges of our diverse gardening regions and to bring plant introductions to retail garden centers throughout California, Oregon, and Washington. More color, less water, easy care, water-wise, ethically sourced. At sunsetplantcollection.com, you'll find plant recommendations, care tips, and retailers near you. I'm curious if there are some specific to the Pacific region issues. Certainly, we've been watching the story about the Western monarchs. I'm curious if you want to talk a little bit about the monarchs or anything else that's specific to the West. What I would say is taking a step back when it comes to monarchs, any type of butterfly or moth, when you're thinking about both providing habitat for them and then also protecting them from pesticides, there's a little bit of a dual consideration because not only are they using the flowers for nectar and food as adults, but they're also obviously feeding on the foliage. So that increases their potential exposure to some of these chemicals because, you know, if a monarch is sprayed and the caterpillars are out there munching away on the milkweed leaves, then that's obviously an exposure roof that's of concern. Similarly, as the adults are nectaring on the flowers. So I think it's just one of those things when you're thinking about any species of concern that you're particularly interested in conserving, it's important to think about the entire life cycle of that organism and all of the different places that they might be at risk, whether it's from pesticides or something else, and also the resources that they need at all of those different life cycles. I actually think we might have skipped something that's really in the category of five minutes to love invertebrates, invertebrates are really weird creatures because they don't have the same physical existence their entire life, right? I think that is one of the things that's so cool about insects is the fact that you know, invertebrates, that you'll start off with an egg and then potentially a larva or a nymph, it'll pupate turn into the adult. I think it's something that's really important to do is, yeah, when you're interested in learning more about an insect that's in your yard, do some research, figure out what it looks like at all of those different life stages and where it might be hanging out, where it might be overwintering. You know, I think overwintering sites are one of the really critical determinations of insect populations in your yard. So it's important to keep leaf litter because so many of our native insect species will overwinter, you know, as eggs or a pupa or underneath that leaf litter, even adults sometimes. And then sometimes those are the first ones that emerge in the spring because they're ready to go because they've overwintered as an adult. We call it diapause, but it's essentially insect hibernation. You think of cavity nesting bees. These are small bees that will nest in something like the center of a plant stem with a kind of a pithy center that they can kind of chew their little nest in and, and lay their eggs there. So you might have some, you know, roses or cane berries, asters that are in your yard and you have those kind of dead looking stems, but actually you've got bee larvae inside that are going to, you know, pupate and turn into adults and emerge. So there's all of these cool places in your yards where you have insects hanging out that you might not realize when you first look, turning it back around to kind of the pest control issues, because we encourage home gardeners to reduce or hopefully eliminate pesticide use in their yards. When you're thinking about alternative management, one of the most important things to do is to understand the life cycle of the pest that you're trying to control, because then you can break that cycle either you know, by interrupting the pest itself physically or eliminating the kind of conditions and resources that the pest needs to thrive. So this isn't just for conserving the insects you want. It also will help you kind of get rid of some of those insects that you don't want. The power of understanding that life cycle. And I know we've talked before about leaving stems and the dead growth, letting that overwinter. And I know that, Erin, I think you had told us before, be cautious not to go clean that up too quickly because those bees need a chance to emerge again, right, in the spring? Right, exactly. Yeah, and especially, you know, when you're thinking about stems. So if you have a plant stem that was a live plant that just died back, you know, a bee's not going to be able to use it that year because they would have. So you have to let that stem 
wait until the next summer when it's a dry stem that a bee can actually chew its way into. And then you have to leave that all the way until the next year by the time the bees actually emerge. And some bees you know, do emerge earlier in the years, but some of them will emerge later in the summer. They're not all emerging at the same time. One of our recommendations is that for those stems, just leave them up until they kind of just start decomposing on their own. You know, don't even worry about cutting them back because once the plant, you know, if it's an aster, for example, you know, puts up its new foliage, you're not even going to see those older stems. But yeah, you have to kind of leave them for a couple winters, if that makes sense. You need to slack off on being too fastidious. Yeah, exactly. I keep wanting to ask designers to give us some tips on this. I think there could be a whole interesting design course on how you camouflage. That would be a really cool conversation, honestly, to have somebody with those design skills talk about how they would incorporate habitat. Or find a way to make it add texture somewhere where it's adding interesting dimension, where it's not just going to look like, oh, there's a dead thing next to a green thing. (laughs) Totally. And one of the things we tell people, too, is sometimes people want to have that more conventional manicured garden aesthetic, right? But you can have sections of your yard maybe that are less visible that you can let be a little bit more wild and provide habitat. There's a lot of different ways to do it, which is cool. As I always like to say, brown is a color. It is, exactly. You have said that a very small percentage of insects in our gardens are actually causing any type of harm. So I'm just wondering if you can give us a little perspective on that, because I think one of the easiest approaches to some of these pest issues is sometimes, are you sure something needs to actually be done? You kind of hit the nail on the head there. So the statistic that I've heard is that when you're thinking about pests and insects, only about 2% of described insect species are what we would consider pests. And the other 98% are, you know, directly beneficial to us or they're otherwise foundational, you know, to ecosystems. So the odds are overwhelmingly when you're looking and you see something small crawling in your garden, it's doing something helpful. When you're considering, oh, do I have to worry about this? Just because something is eating your plant doesn't necessarily mean it's a pest. You know, herbivores exist. They're okay. Most hardy plant, you know, will be resistant to a good amount of herbivory. They're kind of part of that food chain, right? And then beneficial insects like predators and parasitoids will be feeding on those herbivores. And you want those in your garden because those will help keep a pest outbreak from actually exploding. So kind of having this healthy ecosystem, having a little herbivory on your plants is a good thing especially if, you know, you're hoping to provide habitat because, you know, you need to have butterflies and moths. They need to eat plants as caterpillars. When you're starting with plants that are doing really well, those plants can handle a few munches on some leaves. Let's say you are suspicious as a gardener that there is a very real pest situation. Do you recommend like taking a closer look when you want to figure out, hey, is this a pest? Yeah, if something does seem out of balance, because problems do arise even in a really well planned garden. And then like you were saying, the question is then kind of when and how to intervene. Sometimes intervening with a non chemical method is needed when something seems out of balance or the damage is potentially a threat to the survival of the plant. As home gardeners can tolerate more damage to plants than farmers can, for example. But at a certain point, you're like, okay, this plant looks like it's really at risk, or maybe the pest is, you know, eliminating the flowers that you wanted to provide for pollinators or something. The first step is to get a firm identification of what that pest is, because then that's the only way you can really understand the life cycle and how you might be able to take care of it. Smartphones are a really great gardening tool because you can take photos. So taking notes of what you see leaf curling or browning or skeletonizing of leaf veins, things like that. Yeah, knowing exactly what you're dealing with before you make any decisions about management is really important. Next recommendation would be to contact your local extension service or master gardener hotline, which often have you know a diagnostic lab or can otherwise kind of identify or diagnose those issues. Don't shoot first. Yeah, no, you got to understand what's there. I think you were mentioning this earlier on, Sarah, is that the first foundation is prevention, making sure you're planting the right plant in the right place. It has the correct resource for it to you know, survive, appropriate watering, things like that, because stressed plants have a much harder time mustering defenses to insect infestation or to disease. That prevention stage is super important for pest control. Still at the stepped back level, we really encourage planting a diverse suite of plants, you know, in particular, including some native plantings to bolster populations of natural enemies. These are predators and parasitoids that will attack the pest insects. These diverse plantings have been shown to increase the abundance and diversity of these predators and parasitoids. And that's really kind of the foundation of good non-chemical pest control, having that diverse suite of natural enemies. Beyond that, for many diseases and certain larval infestations, just sanitation. So just removing 
that infested plant material is a really good choice to reduce the level of damage and kind of break that development cycle of that pest or disease. You can kind of cut infested flowers or other plant materials and throw it away. You know, you don't want to compost it because you want to take it off site. That is such a great point. In fact, that's such a simple action, especially if when you're seeing something, the damage is really concentrated in one spot. It could just be gone. Some of these insects, you can just kind of come up and be the aggressor yourself as the big, powerful human that you are. <laughs> that is a great way to put it. That was actually going to be my next point for, you know, a lot of insect outbreaks, you know, handpicking or squishing them, knocking them off, you know, with water, for example, can be a really good first step. It can be a little bit tedious, but I've definitely done this in the garden with caterpillars, things like that. You know, you just go out there, look for them, pluck them off. And it's deliberate, it's cautious, and it helps save other wildlife from harm. You have aphids, uh, you know, a quick blast of water can knock those off. There's a lot of pretty simple mechanical ways to deal with those pests. I had a friend whose grandmother used to say, in relation to squishing insects in the garden, you can wash your hands. I love it. You'll be fine. That's a great perspective. I love that. (laughs) So I'm just wondering if you have some suggestions for gardeners who really care about this issue. And maybe it's a concentric circle thing. Are there some things within your neighborhood, within your neighbors, that there's a role to play? Is there perhaps a community role to play in tracking this issue and supporting? It works on all levels. You know, at the individual level, stopping pesticide use at home is something that's really important and easy that you can do, obviously, in your own yard. But then, you know, scaling up, like you were saying, at the kind of community level, talking to your friends and neighbors, if you have a rapport with them, you know, tell them why you garden the way you do and your goals and see if you can kind of get an understanding of where they're coming from and some of their concerns, you know, maybe why they're using some of these chemicals, if they are, then you can potentially provide information. And I think that meeting people where they're at thing is really important. We have the Bee City USA program is an arm of Xerces. One of the things that you have to kind of pledge when you become a Bee City affiliate is to reduce pesticide use and to have an IPM plan. If people are interested, I'd 100% encourage people to see if they can get a ground swelling of support and make their community or campus, because there's also Bee Campus USA, make their city or campus a Bee City. I think one practice that kind of ties into the home garden that's worth talking about is the risk of pesticide exposure from plants purchased at nurseries. At Xerces with partners, we sampled those milkweed plants at nurseries in, in I think it was 15 different states. We found that milkweed samples from that study had an average of 12 pesticides present, including plants that were labeled bee friendly and we don't spray neonics. The demand for nursery plants to be kind of aesthetically appealing and pest free and damage free is really high. Yeah, so that's definitely something to be concerned about, both when you're buying a plant to put into your yard, but also in a general sense. It's like, okay, these pesticides are out there. We've produced two fact sheets. One is buying bee safe plants and the other is offering bee safe plants. You know, I think the three basic steps as a consumer you can take are to ask for organic plants, you know, avoid plants treated with those long lived, highly toxic systemic insecticides like neonics, and try to get to know nursery practices to see if they're using pollinator friendly production. A lot of the nurseries might not know the answer because they're buying them from growers and they might not know all of the particulars. But I think asking those questions will demonstrate consumer demand for bee safe plants. Hopefully, if more and more people kind of are aware of the issue, they can potentially shift what some of the nurseries are offering. I guess this is where I can kind of dive and talk a little bit about neonics. Neonics are a hot topic insecticide when it comes to bee conservation because they're, you know, highly toxic. And the other issue with them is that they're systemic, which means the plant uptakes these chemicals and expresses them throughout the plant. So the leaves, but then also the pollen and the nectar will all be contaminated with the pesticide. So if you're munching the plant or if you're pollinating the plant. Exactly. You're still going to be exposed to neonics. They're highly toxic and many of them can be quite persistent, particularly in woody plants. They can stay for, in some cases, years, but for even an herbaceous plant. So if you purchased a plant at a nursery, that it's contaminated with neonics or has been treated with neonics for that first growing season, there's likely going to be measurable amounts of neonics. If you have a plant and you're not sure whether it's been contaminated with neonics, you can still plant it, but you can net it with like a fine mesh for that first growing season so that pollinators and other beneficial insects can't actually access it and you know that risk of exposure is lessened. You can also try to knock some of the soil off of the roots because sometimes these pesticides are applied as soil drenches for the plant's roots to uptake. That's shocking. I just had this assumption. You know, you get a nursery plant, you bring it home, it's got a very minimal amount of soil with it. And my assumption would have been that a short quarantine and these things dissipate. But it sounds to me like 
the neonics are, like you said, persistent, which is very concerning. And I think that raises enough an alarm bell to say, when you're purchasing plants, you need to be asking those questions. I do appreciate that you mentioned your resources. I want to say that we are going to include, along with the transcript, we'll have a whole list of links and resources, fact sheets. It's so fun talking about invertebrates, even though it's very tragic and sad. And I wish you hadn't told me about the origin of the name Xerxes. I, I mean, I knew that it was a butterfly, but I didn't realize that it was like a tragically lost butterfly that was like right near my homeland. But I do want to stress, despite the doom and gloom, you know, about insect declines and the impacts that pesticides have, the fact that insects are really able to use these small habitat patches, yards, parks, things like that, which is amazing. What does it look like when we design our urban spaces and our towns and landscapes within those to be without the harmful chemicals? That can happen. We can control that future, right? Homeowners, renters, people who are managing our urban spaces like parks, schools, all of these green spaces in urban areas are reducing or limiting pesticide use and using a lot of these other resources. There's a lot of cool organizations doing really neat stuff, trying to promote athletic fields being managed without pesticides. We have golf courses, places like that, the connectivity that would provide for habitat really does scale up to that landscape level. And we can provide this connected habitat for invertebrates, but other animals and organisms as well across the landscape and provide connectivity to extant habitat on the outside of cities, having this mental image of this interconnected, green, wonderful urban space. I think that potential is there. We just have to make the conscious decision to do that. I think I was not taking seriously enough the potential danger of bringing home a plant to my garden that I didn't necessarily have a full origin trace on. You know, there's only so far you can take this information because it sounds like Xerxes Society has discovered some instances, at least in some cases, of plants that were labeled as non-sprayed that clearly had residue on them. This idea that bringing something home and letting it sit for a while or brushing off some soil, <laughs> some of these chemicals are sticking around. And the fact that they might still impact an insect, what, months later? I think that this is another place where we can have that back and forth with consumers and producers to kind of push right. the edge a little bit more. And sometimes producers push the edge in good ways, and sometimes we can push the edge in good ways have this evolving line of best practices when it comes to stuff that we're bringing into our home. And on the positive side, Pacific Horticulture interacts all the time with some very reputable nurseries, and there are so many of them. There are many people in this industry who are alert to these issues and who are doing very careful practice around sourcing plants, tracking where those plants are from. I just don't think I had looked closely at the science, and some of the science is really new, and some of this research is really new, and it isn't extensive yet either. But it's certainly enough to be alarming. I loved that idea that Aaron brought up of our gardens being able to be refuges from the greater community of spraying. So if you're living in a more rural area with agriculture around you, your garden can actually be an insect refuge for right. those invertebrates that are in your area. And I kind of had this 200 foot level perspective of imagining all these gardens in an urban or suburban setting kind of linking up and being this refugia for invertebrates. This is like one of our favorite ideas. There's another element of this, which he really gently brings up, like that sort of nosy neighbor component where we get to think about building our relationships with the other people who garden nearby. And this isn't about being aggressively confrontational. This is where Aaron and Xerxes really have a gift to share, which is how do you have these conversations? Perhaps having a conversation with someone that you know might be using pesticides or herbicides in your neighborhood. Maybe there is an opportunity. There's a lot of really nice entry points for hey, you know, 
if I think there's an issue in my garden, if I think I'm having a pest issue, like how do I really assess that? Maybe there's not even such a big problem. <laughs> For more from Aaron Anderson, you can check out his very popular article from last year, I did my graduate research in a garden ecology lab, and this is what gardeners want to know. That article can be found at pacifichorticulture.org. Thanks everyone for listening today. If you liked Garden Futurist, please share it on your favorite social media platform or follow us on Spotify. Find us at pacifichorticulture.org. 